Well, if anyone didn't recognize that as 76 trombones from the music man, go back to the rear of the class. <laughs> and, of course, it was Robert Preston, the music man himself, doing the vocalizing. Here's an interesting question. Flying saucers, do they exist or don't they? How can some of the sightings of flying saucers be explained? Is anything going on that the public just doesn't know about? Now, these are some of the questions that we have for our next guest, Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence J. Tacker of the United States Air Force, who's written a new book called Flying Saucers in the U.S. Air Force, the official Air Force story. And welcome to Monitor, Colonel Tacker. Thank you, George. I assure you, I assure you, you won't have any problem with flying saucers in Radio Central. <laughs> Good. You never know. Colonel Tacker, let's give you the big question right at the start. Do you believe in flying saucers? Well, that question involves semantics, Mort. Do you mean uh, an unidentified flying object, or do you mean a spaceship? Well, what do you mean by a flying saucer? <laughs> well, uh, that's the question. If you are asking me if people are seeing things in the heavens, the answer is definitely yes. If you're asking me if they are seeing spaceships, the answer is no. That's definite. That's definite, sir. Very positively uh -huh. stated, anyway. Uh, Colonel, uh, I guess it's an unvarnished truth that some people believe the Air Force is withholding information from the public. Now, let's ask you very bluntly, is there any truth to this? Absolutely not. That's pure rubbish. Mm -hmm. The Air Force does not withhold information. In fact, we have a policy to with release information on this subject to the public as soon as we have analyzed and evaluated a given sighting. Well, Colonel, does the Air Force deny the possibility of life on other planets? Or, let's put it this way, that we're being watched by intelligent beings from other planets? Well, if that's one question, uh, Mort, I'd like to answer it in two parts. Break it up. All right. The Air Force does not deny the possibility of life on other planets. Oh? Uh, actually, uh, the entire scientific community agrees that there could be planets uh, in other galaxies... Uh, which could support life uh, just like Earth does. However, we do say that we are not being watched by intelligent beings from other planets at this time. That is, we do not have any evidence to date, and by to date I mean right now, that yeah. substantiates such a conclusion. Well, what accounts for these people who say they have seen flying saucers, uh, and so many of them have, uh, saying that they are manned, and some of them say that they have seen sort of people in the more coming out of them. Well, what we have here, Mort, is, uh, again, a question of semantics on what you call evidence. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, most of our scientific community uh, are frustrated yeah. by the evidence that is presented to us uh, by these UFO groups. Hmm. Uh, it won't support uh, any scientific uh, investigation. Uh, and uh, actually... Uh, uh, we just can't uh, uh, come up with an answer and say that uh, flying saucers uh, are spaceships from other planets. They're UFOs, they're unidentified flying objects. I'd like to go into that a little bit further and point out that the United States Air Force, by law, is charged with the air defense of the United States, mm -hmm. and that this whole UFO question is just one little part of air defense. Uh, by that I mean we're required by law to detect and then go up and identify any unidentified object in the sky or in space to see if it's a threat to the national security. And these would be considered a threat if they were legitimate visitations from other planets. Of course they would. Uh, uh, Colonel Tacker, some of these things have been explained adequately, I believe. But uh, aren't there some that still have no explanation at all? Well, we do have a small percentage which are labeled as unexplained. Mm -hmm. However, the Air Force does feel that if sufficient information had been given at the initial sighting, that we could have explained them. Now, I, I'd like to ask, too, is this uh, official position uh, pretty heartily endorsed by the people who have had contact, or is it an official position as opposed to uh, the private p uh, positions that might be taken by people who've had experience in this sort of thing. And well, by experience, I mean actually participated in sightings. I'm referring to the, for instance, the 1952 occasion when they, uh, they claimed to have seen something on radar over the military field opposite National Airport in Washington. Well, the 1952 sightings in Washington, of course, were caused by a temperature inversion, mm. uh, which is a warm layer of air lying over a cold air layer, 
which uh, results in uh, a refraction and mirages of uh, both visual sightings, lights at altitude, uh, and on the radar scopes. Uh, and in this particular instance, uh, uh, after sifting the information through the scientific criteria, they came up with this answer. Now, the uh, UFO groups, the individual groups, the uh, hobby groups that uh, are investigating these things from time to time disagree, of course, with this particular answer, and they disagree with many of our answers. It's the interpretation uh, of these sightings wherein we're questioned. Well, we've been taking the word sighting rather generally. I wonder if maybe uh, you could give us an example of one of the most spectacular sightings that's been reported. Well, of course, the actual uh, contact stories uh, published uh, in books uh, would be the most sensational. But as far as a UFO sighting, which was reported to the Air Force, is concerned, uh, I would say that uh, probably the Pacific sightings of 1959, July 1959, would be the most sensational, uh, in that uh, they involved many airline pilots mm -hmm. who were en route from California to Hawaii. And uh, what we got there were many reports by radio from the planes before they landed that they had seen this object going at a fantastic speed. They viewed it from three to five seconds, and uh, some pilots were alarmed, said it seemed to come straight toward the aircraft and then veer away. Uh, other pilots said, well, it looked like a meteor, except for the fact that it seemed to head toward the aircraft. It proved to be a meteor of the fireball class. I see. Colonel, I I'm sure that you go into quite an explanation in your book about flying saucer sightings and uh, your explanation of what most of them have been and are. And uh, it's been a very fascinating conversation here for myself and I'm sure for George. I know one thing. I want to read that book of yours. And I want to ask one quick question, Colonel. Uh, do you expect to have further information from the United States Air Force? Is there another study to be released soon? Uh, in the book, we point out that Project Blue Book is a continuing thing. Mm -hmm. And they are about to compile and release some new statistics which, com which will come out in early 1961. And we certainly shall be looking forward to those. Very nice to talk to you, Colonel. And uh, we'd like to mention the title of your book, Flying Saucers in the U.S. Air Force, written by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence J. Tacker of the United States Air Force. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Billy May and the orchestra with the girls against the boys. And now may we say that portions of this program are pre-recorded. Sounds Chinese, doesn't it? None. Flying saucers. The official Air Force story. It says on this book is out. Uh, flying saucers in the U.S. Air Force. Colonel Lawrence Tacker. I'm Senator Colonel Tacker. will be in, along with Donald Kehoe, who believes very much in flying saucers. Mr. Tacker, I would say, Colonel Tacker doesn't exactly. Um, and we'll have the two of them to say a few words to each other, friendly, I trust. And I may stick my own neck in, too, uh, because I've read the book, and, and I have lots of things to... Well, about 400 notes I made in it, so... I can't resist them all. Speaking of optical illusions, like you just were a moment ago with that kooky window over in the corner, I have one right here. What's that? What? Do you believe really that flying saucers do exist or don't? Well, that's a matter of semantics, uh, Dave. What do you mean by a flying saucer? <coughs> do you mean a spaceship? No. I mean an unidentified flying object, I Certainly. guess. Certainly. I believe unidentified flying objects uh, occur and that many uh, solid citizens see them. What do you think they are? Well, in most instances, we've been able to explain all of them as either conventional objects under extenuating circumstances or some form of aerial phenomena. Well, phenomena isn't an object, is it? No, we it's said not. Objects, we said. All right, so sir. That would rule out phenomena. All what right, about uh, unidentified objects? However, it's originally reported as an object. 
Well, if it isn't, it's a matter of semantics, as right. you said. That's right. right. Um, what was the other classification now uh, that you just mentioned? Either phenomena or... Conventional objects seen under extenuating circumstances. An aircraft, for instance. I see. Uh, in a, unusual light conditions. Right. Or in a fog or something like that. Mm -hmm. That opinion was given by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Tacker, U.S. Air Force spokesman on the question of unidentified flying objects. An author of this just published book, Flying Saucers and the U.S. Air Force. The official Air Force story, it says here. Um, Major Kehoe is our guest this morning, too. Major Donald Kehoe. Do you believe that flying saucers or UFOs, unidentified flying objects, exist, Major? Yes, I do, Mr. Garraway. <coughs> We've evaluated evidence in our National Committee in Washington. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I've, I've confused the semantic issue here. I've oh. said both at the same time. Do you believe that flying saucers exist? Uh, space well, I don't like that nickname any more than the Air Force does. I believe that flying objects under intelligent control exist, and that's uh, the belief shared by the majority of our committee in Washington. Flying objects under intelligent control. That's right. Um, very well. That's the belief of Major Donald Kehoe, U.S. Marine Corps, retired, author of several books and head of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Uh, this book. Colonel Tacker has occupied me over much of the weekend. It was a very exciting book to read. I've read some of Major Kehoe's books, too. Um, Air Force figures, I believe, show that there have been 6,523 reported sightings over the past 13 years. What percentage of these, according to Air Force standards, remain unexplained? Well, I'd have to go back uh, to the early days uh, and admit that in the very beginning, when this was a new subject in, say, 47 and 1950, that the... Uh, the unknowns or the unidentified uh, uh, cases ran as high as 20%. Uh, by 1953, they were down to 9%, and now they run somewhere between 2 and 3%. 2 and 3%. Yes, sir. Uh, Major Keyhole, do you agree with that? No, I don't, because uh, the Air Force has issued a statement, in fact, it's repeated in the Colonel's book here, without any qualifications, that the Air Force has explained all but about 2% of the totals. I have here a letter signed by an official in the Air Force which says that up to the end of 1959, there were 565 cases unexplained, a total of 9 and 4 tenths percent, and incidentally the official was Colonel Lawrence J. Tucker. That's right. Well, that's what I just said. I know, but you keep putting out this statement that the Air Force has explained all but so-and-so of the total reported, and it doesn't qualify. It merely it gives the people the impression that you have only a dribble left of those cases. What about that, Colonel? Well, uh, I think I uh, stated it correctly when you initially asked me, Dave. I said in the early days uh, that they probably ran higher. Uh, the investigative well. techniques went as good. We, uh, it was a new subject. Uh, this is where uh, the uh, science fiction type thing that uh, Major Kehoe writes got started. Uh, may I read a paragraph from the book here? Uh, many sightings by qualified and reliable witnesses have been reported. However, each incident seems to have an unsatisfactory facts associated with it, such as shortness of time under observation. Um, if you saw Marilyn Monroe walking by and you saw her for one second, would that be adequate? I'd probably recognize her. That's what I mean. Inaccurate estimates of distance from the observer. Um, how is that known that they're inaccurate? Uh, Generally, just by a simple mathematical uh, computation at the uh, Technical Intelligence Center. How do they know the, what the distance is? Well, just based upon the size of the object given. Well, if... They can determine. But the object isn't given. It generally is in the report. The yeah. object and the size, the approximate size. Well, if we don't know what the object is, how can we give the size? Well, they give the size, as yeah. it appeared in the sighting. Oh, the angular yes, size. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That doesn't tell you anything about the distance, does it? Oh, they can work out distance for that, certainly. With one, one sighting of an angular object, like a star, <coughs> or a planet, or a, anything? Yes, sir. Well, astronomy would like to know that. That's the Doppler effect. It says, uh, lack of photographs. Must a photograph be taken of something? No, a photograph mustn't be taken, but a photograph is good evidence. Yes, but the lack of it constitutes uh, unsatisfactory facts. That's right. Does. Wouldn't it be much better to have one? And a serious lack of, yes, but uh, not having one, uh, again, if Marilyn Rowe walked by, you might not get to take a picture, but you'd sure know she was there. Uh, a serious lack of descriptive data that I'd prevented sure definite... I'd seen something, yeah. I think you might know what you'd seen, too. A serious lack of descriptive data that prevented definite conclusions from being drawn. Again, if Marilyn Monroe walked by, would you have a serious lack of descriptive data which prevented definite conclusions from being drawn? Um, do you have to draw conclusions You're when kidding, you see something? Dave, aren't you? 
Not really? at all. No. When you see something and you describe it, do you have to draw conclusions about it in order for your you sight to be valid? You certainly do. I don't think so, uh, but there we go. Uh, Major Kehoe, let's take you on for a bit now. Um, after we take a station break, if you may, for two minutes. We're talking with Senator Colonel Tucker and Major Kehoe on unidentified flying objects. Uh, Major, you've maintained for some years now, I believe, that the Air Force is, according to you, deliberately misinforming the public on the subject. Uh, how do you support such a serious charge? We sent a confidential report. When I say uh, confidential, I mean it was confidential to members of the Congress in July and since then. And this states uh, a digest of the evidence. Now, in this book, Colonel Tacker says that all the congressmen who talked with the Air Force officers about the subject were completely satisfied with the Air Force answers. I'd like to mention letters. I have all letters here and about wow. 50 more in Washington. Yeah. Representative John McCormick, House Majority Leader, says that the House Select Committee, of which he was chairman, tried to get information, was able, unable to do so, and a number of them were convinced that there were unexplained objects. Representative Joseph well. Carth said on executive sessions that they tried to get it from the Air Force. The Air Force took refuge in security and said this was involved with the nation's That's safety. That's absolutely erroneous. We've never taken refuge I'm in security. Are you calling Representative Carth a liar? Are you calling McCormick a liar? Are you calling liar? General White a liar? Did you read the forward to the if book? I, uh, Colonel, if I were in your... I read Have the you for called uh, Mr. Horner uh, a liar? They made the I statement. I don't use the word liar if I can. You made it. Help. You were the one that brought it up. All right, now wait a minute. You're trying to keep me from reading the rest of these congressional names. I'm not names, trying to I keep know, you from obviously. doing it. We have letters here from a number of congressmen who say they are completely and seriously concerned over the secrecy. This report they accepted as proof that these objects That's were the worst real. bunch of drivel I ever read. That well, report. I, what did you say about the forward, uh, Colonel? It proves what? I asked uh, uh, what he thought of General White's statement. No, uh, is that? Not, but I recall that you said, uh, you said in reference to one of those, have you read I General White's statement? Yes, and I asked if he was saying that General White's statement was erroneous. In regard to what? In regard to what? In regard to the fact that uh, no spaceships have ever been found. Oh. That they don't exist. That wasn't what we were talking about, I believe. No, it was not. And I would, if I can, I'd like to finish this. This uh, drivel you well, talked uh, about was, was approved by <laughs> the former head of the Central Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Hill and Carter. Edwin Knowles, Colonel Emerson, Army Reserve, Major Fournay, a former Munder, your project, and about 200 scientists, engineers, and others, uh, none of whom could be called crackpot types. Uh, now, in here, these people say that they are concerned with it for two reasons. There's a danger involved in the present Air Force policy. You have had hundreds of... Let me of interrupt hundreds again and say there is no such policy. The policy is stated in your book to explain away these. Air Force Regulation 200-2 says... It's in the book, too. B-9, I know it, B-9 says all Air Force activities must reduce the reports to the minimum. Section now, 18 I'm, says that all information will be given to the public and it won't be classified. Well, it certainly is not. Yes, now, but like, the right, information case, given out is that which has been reduced to a minimum, according to the I same director. I would like director. to have your answer on this specific case. This is a key case in Washington, in the Washington side. Well, I know that you disagree with the interpretations of some of our findings uh, Colonel, in the cases. if you're going to talk me down question, and not allow me to present evidence, I have a statement in here by you in which you brush off the Washington sightings at the temperature inversion. There's a temperature inversion. That's Fine. exactly right. You stated in there that the, these things were not picked up by radar at Andrews Air Force Base. I did not state that. Oh, yes, they you did. They were picked up by radar. I beg your pardon. It's oh, at Andrews Air Force Base. That's you're right. correct. That's All right, right. you're I correct. correct. They were on the radar at the National Airport. I have here a signed report by an Air Force weather observer, radar expert who was in the tower. Describes picking up these blips. So they we don't consider those people experts. I have 4,000 hours uh, on radar scopes. That's all right. Uh, there are a lot of people that are expert on radar because that's their livelihood. They guide airliners into the right. airport. If they're no good, if your air defense people are no good on radar, how are they going to tell us about Soviet bombers? Let me get to this. This person said that they were picked up on the blip, on the radar. They had a group of them. They came in in formation. They split up. They operated at speeds over 900 miles an hour. Now, you deny flat Apparently, flatly. right. At Washington Airport, the experts on radar track these things at speeds up to 7,200 miles an hour. radar operator is not an expert, Major All right. Kehoe. Is a weather observer? Uh, operator, just like Major, the man that uses these... Uh, I have to interrupt, gentlemen, to, to do two things unhappily. Exactly how long do we have? 30 seconds. 30 seconds uh, to the thing. Uh, well, I have to interrupt because uh, we've run out of time. I suggest everybody read this and find out for yourself what you think of it. I find such <laughs> exciting facts in here, some I believe to be 
exactly right and some I believe to be exactly wrong because they're self-contradictory, some of them. But I'd like to know more about it. All uh, right, Dave. read it and talk to you about it further. Right, sir. Uh, so find out more about these things uh, and see what you think of them. Film Tacker's book is the official Air Force story. Station break right now. But what he says essentially is that uh, under unidentified flying objects are investigated. So far, not a single bit of material evidence of the existence of spaceships has been found. Uh, well, you have to... What he ties in there, Dave, is the fact that by an act of Congress, the United States Air Force is charged with the air defense of the United States. Right. And you can't separate UFOs from our air defense mission. No, You can't possibly that. do it. Um, We're charged with it, therefore we go up. We scramble on, at times based on these things. But must material evidence of the existence of something be found before it's real? Certainly, I believe so. I don't think you have anything. Do you ever have a piece of the moon in your hand? No. Is it real? Oh, I'd say it was, yeah. But uh, then you have a uh, spectrum analysis of light that they've taken. Uh, you've got... Uh, uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm an information officer Neither and a reporter. Sure. I'm a uh, but uh, uh, there are such things as photographs and spectrum analysis and uh, mathematical counts that they can uh, build up to a basis and come up with a pure scientific answer, not a vague statement by somebody that, sure, spaceships exist. I believe it is an act of faith. And of course, that's all right if they believe it as an act of faith. But uh, what I object to and uh, is a, this countless harangue that the Air Force is withholding information. This is ridiculous. Well, just saying it's ridiculous won't prove it one way or the other, will it? Yes, it will. Oh, you mean my saying it's ridiculous? No, but I can prove it. That we have it withheld can, information. You can't prove it because we have cases you have withheld. <clears throat> and if you have. The top, you mean the you public. have cases we have with hell. I'm talking about NICAP, the general I'm public. I'm talking about NICAP. What is NICAP? NICAP it's a is UFO a... hobby group. Oh, I know what that. Are you saying that Hill and Carter and Top Ad We've got high Air Force officers. Colonel Joseph Bryan, Air Force Reserve. Colonel Mackishan, Air Force Reserve. You're William impressing Lee. me immensely, Major. I, I'm not trying to impress you. Matter of fact, if you keep your temper, we might get down to some facts here. I have no temper here. I'm just I will, real concerned I will and make believe you, my side I will make you an story. offer. I will agree to appear with you in public and disclose what we don't have time to put on here. If you can prove that what you say is true, I will resign as director of NICAP. I will recommend to Admiral Hill and Carter that we disband. Well, I will tell him to I will close do that if you bring this off. evidence up. I will prove the existence hold it, hold it, of stations. Hold it. We've just uh, taken out 10 minutes of the show. Later on, we can come back for 10 more minutes. Uh, right. right now, we're going to take the news, all right? Sure. And uh, I think if we keep you apart for those intervening 15 minutes, it might be wise. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, Dave. No problem. No problem. I'm enjoying it. So am I. I hope Major Keogh is. I hope you are, too. WRC-TV, Washington. The switchboards are loaded with calls about our discussion of flying saucers and the U.S. Air Force here. The new book out by Lieutenant, uh, Lawrence, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence J. Tacker, United States Air Force. We've been discussing it uh, with Major Donald Kehoe, who is head of one of the uh, several groups on, uh, who believe in flying objects, I believe, flying saucers or spaceships. Uh, let's continue and uh, let's talk about facts now as best we can. Uh, Colonel White, we, we discussed that one. I'll take another fact. Um, the astronomy information given in here, as straight astronomy information in the chapter, it's easy to be fooled where you say many things are really astronomical objects, is uh, interesting to me because I've been fooling around with it for several years, like 27, I think. Um, well, you must be uh, fairly familiar with well, it. I'm, I'm, again, keep in mind I was reporting. I got this from the scientific people. But it's in the book and, and to be mm -hmm. taken, therefore, right. is right. Good. When an aircraft, you're speaking about the planet Venus now, as the aircraft moves through the atmosphere at an advanced speed, its position relative to the object naturally changes. Um, does the object, therefore, change its position, apparently? The, uh, the aircraft changes its position. Uh, 10 miles out of uh, 80 million, perhaps. Oh, I see. You mean it would be infinitesimal. Well, no matter where you fly on the Earth, Venus will be almost exactly the same place. You're right. You're correct. Uh, there are about a dozen of those that I would like to bring up, but I want to introduce Major Kehoe. Well, uh, and you, you, you have to remember program. the azimuth of the body does keep changing. Not the apparent azimuth of the planet. That remains the same. But the azimuth of the body, based on the true heading of the aircraft, keeps changing. I believe that's what they Not mean. Not measurably. There. Oh, me measurably, Dave. It changes all the time with the celestial tables. When I shoot the, uh, the uh, stars or, or the or Oh, the you mean sun? the rotation of the That's Earth? That's right, right. Well, not in any 
period that you, uh, when the aircraft moves through the atmosphere, you say the object appears to be moving. It doesn't appear to be moving. The sun doesn't appear to move in the sky. No, it's the heading of the aircraft is what they mean there. That the, the actual uh, azimuth of the body keeps changing. Oh, if you turn the, the aircraft around. Right, yeah. right. That's what, I'm, that's what I believe they mean. I see. Uh, Major, uh, <coughs> you have something you want to say. Well, I wanted to say that the whole thing weight, uh, rests on the weight of evidence. Now, we have gone into all the reports which the Air Force has released. And in 52 and 53, they were releasing quite a lot of cases to me. This board of advisors that we have include some of the top scientists in the country. Incidentally, uh, Colonel, you mentioned Dr. Olivier and the American Meteor Society. It might interest you to know the American Meteor Society is a member of NICAP, and so is Dr. Olivier. Uh, he does not agree with the Air Force stand and the secrecy. Do you also mentioned Dr. Carl G. Jung, the Hi. famous analyst. You imply there that he thinks everybody's crackpot. Dr. Jung is also a member of NICAP. I have two letters here from him in which he says, I have no doubt that these things may be real. It seems this last book, he's referring to my last book, said that seems to prove that they are real. And he says the Air Force policy is stupid, stupid and unpsychological because it'll do, it will create panic more than it will help it. If they are withholding information. They are withholding they information. They are not withholding information. Well, according to all the congressmen that I have talked with recently about this, they say the Air Force is. Now, in 1957, we asked you for a number of cases. You didn't even have the courtesy to reply to those cases, and two or three of them are very hot ones. But, and, but since we're short of time, I'd like to you ask everything you everything you've asked for. Only you have it. Yes, I have. I asked you for the inside of the Captain Ryan case, where you people sent an airliner to chase one of these objects. And, 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 the, number, and the case of the F-80... Well, you never sent an airliner to chase one I of these objects. I have the tape, the transcript. It's in Senator Monroe's You said office. you had it. I've never seen it. I never heard it. Any time you care to hear it, and I have the transcript here, I'll give you a copy of it. All right. He stated they were ordered to chase, they left the course with passengers and chased this thing for 100 miles. All of this evidence has, in, has impressed enough people. Now, I would say you might question uh, Senator Barry Goldwater, who is a Brigadier General in, in your United Air Force States Reserve. Air Force, right. He said, I had lunch with him about two, three years ago. He said he was convinced that, that this thing was real. He has stated so later in the newspapers. He didn't say what they were, but they were real, and he says the Air Force clams up. Now, you can't quote, you can't disagree with a man who's both a senator and Brigadier General. Well, I checked that senator, statement out. You made that on the last, uh, you made that very point on the last program you were on with Dave yeah. Galloway, and I checked that out with his office, and they have no record well, of yes, such a statement. Have. Oh, yes, No, they, they don't. Well, I'll show you the record. All Anytime right. you care to come up to our office, That's what I mean. You. you keep talking about the record, and you keep talking you about the evidence. Well, we're all well, talking let's don't get about back to personality. We can't project evidence through the machine, no. No, unless it's a visible object, and there are no... no. Well, now, there's, here, there's one more person I'd like to mention, and that's presidential, President-elect Kennedy. About a year ago, he wrote to one of our members and called this an important topic. Now, would you say that he was one of the deluded? Well, I think it's a real important people? topic, and I want to stress right now that the Air Force doesn't deny the possibility of these things. It simply states that to date, there is no evidence to come up with a sensational claim that there are extraterrestrial uh, well, Vehicles in, in our atmosphere. In 1948, right. and you have denied that document exists, that in 1948 there was a es top secret estimate that these things were interplanetary. Now that was stated first by Captain Ruppel. I've never had, seen or heard of it. Captain Ruppel, head of the project, stated it. He said it was a black document stamped top secret on the cover. And it said that. It wasn't any just opinion. Later we checked with Major Dewey Fournay, who was the monitor of the project at that time and is now on our board. I have a letter, which I'll show you later, in which he says, I'm hereby confirming the existence of two documents the Air Force has denied. One of them is a 1948 estimate, and the other is his own 1952 conclusion, which you also have kept under wraps. Well, if, if it's his conclusion, no, it's not it, ATICs it or the Air Forces. And I can say right now there's no such Air May Force conclusion. Here? Yeah, uh, sure, Dave. Sir, could, could you afford to say in your official position that there would be such a document if it were secret? Could I say? If there, such a document did exist and it were stamped top secret or secret, could you admit the existence of it as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force? I doubt it. But having a top secret clearance and having gone through all the documents, there is no such document. Or you just said that <clears throat> you doubt if you could say so. Um, no, I can say there isn't one. It was burned, declassified and burned, according to Rupelt. Forney says the same thing. Well, I just mean this generally. Can an officer mm -hmm. admit the existence of any top secret document uh, about Yes, you can, concept. and you can say you're in a classified area, and then, of course, it's off. But well, this situation doesn't exist with UFOs. Well, then we have to take that statement in view of the statement you just made. 
uh, I think. Uh, that there well, is no such document. That's right. And that an officer can state such a fact if it exists. That's right. Very well. Uh, that's the question I wanted to ask, Major. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to box you in here. Well, go ahead. Two of you. Go ahead. Um, will you defend this book, please? If, because we're attacking it, apparently. Um, why, why is the Air Force so... Uh, why did you write an official book about this subject? Right. I, I felt the book had to be written because uh, I felt the Air Force was being set upon uh, by Major Kehoe, by NICAP, by the other UFO hobby groups who believe in who believe in uh, uh, spaceships uh, uh, as a act of pure faith uh, I felt that I had to do it because of these uh, senseless accusations against the Air Force uh, in line with that let me for a minute uh, show you uh, uh, that when the Air Force does investigate a flying saucer it has at, at its disposal the resources of the Air Research and Development Command, the resources of the Air Materiel Command, the National Space Surveillance Center at Hanscom, Hanscom Field in Bedford, Massachusetts, which can tell you now, on the first orbit, if Russia or anybody else has something up. Uh, we have all the university laboratories at our, our uh, uh, disposal. Uh, we have all the weather stations. We have countless radar stations. We have instantaneous communications with Fairbanks, Alaska, Wiesbaden, Germany, Japan, uh, any place we want. And when I compare this to uh, uh, what your equipment probably is, a typewriter and some stationery, it doesn't add up very well. I think well, it's ridiculous. Uh, may I answer that, Mr. Garraway? Uh, yes, sir. Our equipment includes about 200 men, including top astronomers, missile trackers, for instance, Captain McLaughlin in the United States Navy. Professor Herman Oberth, one of the great rocket experts. I could name as many as you wished, and, and we could cover every field involved in space travel planning. Our equipment is material which we take and, and hand over to these experts and sometimes outside scientists. And Where evaluate. Where do you get it from, the newspapers? We get it from confidential reports given to us by some of your own Air Force people. And is I that be, a fact? Yes, that's a fact. Uh, these things will be certified. Well, we had one on Oxford Air Force Base in 1957. The Air Force denied that it happened. The CAA radar operator said they tracked this object at 3,600 miles an hour over Oxford Air Force Base. But what it boils down to is you have to. You're under orders to deny that. That is not so. Well, you that's have to. Your job that is, is not such so. If I were in your shoes, I would have to do exactly you what you're doing. You don't know anything about my job. Colonel, I'm going to ask you to explain one case here. I... On, uh, uh, last, last August, at Red Bluff, California, two state troopers reported that <clears throat> they were sighting an object which at one time hovered 500 feet above their patrol car. It cut out their radio and swept the ground with the red light. They pointed their own red light up and this object immediately climbed at high speed. Air Force radar red bus said they were tracking the object. They told the San Francisco Chronicle and other papers. Air Force oh. radar at Red Bluff Wait a did minute. not track it, and they made the statement that they had nothing oh. on the scope. They told the newspaper. I read this report and, yesterday. All right, now wait a minute, I'm not finished. We asked you about this. One of our members asked, and then we asked. You stated that th these people had been misled by seeing the planet Mars, exactly. the star Aldebaran, and the star Betelgeuse. Exactly. Now, wait a minute. We checked with the Hayden Planetarium in Boston and other astronomers. They projected this on the heavens. Mars did not rise for an hour afterwards. Aldebaran did not rise for two hours. Betelgeuse for three hours below the Don't horizon. you understand what happened? I understand perfectly. There was a you temperature invasion up. for six days. Do you know what a temperature inversion does? I know exactly it what It causes are. refraction and a mirage above the horizon. How much refraction? Not for three hours. The light rays. It doesn't pick up a star at three it hours. Mars was just below the horizon. I'm you're not going to argue with you. I'm giving you what our scientific community your, told me. You're putting your worry against the astron astronomers who are every day working out problems like that. I have a I'm sketch using the word of things. astronomers that work for the United States Air Force, sir. Under contract and under orders to try to explain these away until you're ready to answer. That's ridiculous. Why don't well, you get off gentlemen. that kick? You don't believe it yourself. Well, Colonel, uh, I'm not I must indulge in personalities with you, but I will repeat my offer. We have to take a station break here. Um, <laughs> no, we have to leave you. I, I don't know where we are. <laughs> I wasn't very much interested in flying saucers until I read your book. Now I'm fascinated. Good, sir. Because it's such an area of controversy here. Um, shall I say peace? <laughs>